Hello? Yep. All right. We apologize for the delay, but uh, now you're good to go. Chairman Goodlatte, Ranking Member Conyers, and members of the committee, my name is Krish Gupta, and I'm Senior Vice President and Deputy General Counsel for EMC Corporation. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding patent litigation reform and express EMC's strong support for the Innovation Act. Headquartered in Hopkinton, Massachusetts, EMC is a global leader in cloud computing as well as data storage, backup, and recovery systems. EMC has a keen interest in seeing that our patent system is rational, fair, and evenly balanced. We create many innovations and look to the U.S. patent system to protect those innovations and the jobs that result from them. We have more than 3,600 U.S. patents. At EMC, I have worldwide responsibility for IP law and licensing matters, including patent litigation. In my 20 years in this field, I have witnessed firsthand how our patent system has undergone transformation, not always for the better. Abusive patent litigation has swept our country, diverting billions of dollars from economic growth and innovation to battling frivolous suits filed by patent assertion entities, or PAEs. Since 2005, EMC has been sued by PAEs over 30 times and has never found to have infringed. As a matter of principle, we don't settle frivolous suits, but defending those suits has cost us millions and has caused great disruption of our business, requiring our employees to shift their attention from designing new products and growing the business to sitting in depositions or going to court. EMC is not alone in this regard. For us, a typical PAE suit involves a shell company with secret backers created solely to file suits. The PAE often sues EMC and dozens of companies in separate suits that get consolidated for pretrial purposes. The complaint is often vague, provides little information about the specific infringement allegations. When cases are consolidated, we lose some of our due process rights. We are forced to compromise on defense strategies and incur additional legal fees in coordinating with others. Furthermore, PAEs try to pressure us into settlement by demanding thousands of documents and emails during discovery, most of which are irrelevant to the suit and costly to produce. If we want a decision on the merits, we have to typically wait two years, spend millions, and endure massive business disruption. Meanwhile, the PAE has nothing to lose. With lawyers on contingency and a steady income stream from defendants who have settled along the way. Faced with these choices, most defendants cave and are forced to settle, but we don't. EMC supports the reforms set forth in the Innovation Act. Five key elements of this bill are of particular importance to us. First, this bill ensures that PAEs have something to lose when they file meritless suits. We believe the fee-shifting provision will strongly discourage the filing of frivolous suits. Second, this bill levels the playing field by requiring disclosure of the real party in interest and permitting joinder of that party. Entities that have a financial interest in a lawsuit should not be able to operate in secrecy. They should be part of the suit, subject to counterclaims, and liable for attorney's fees for frivolous suits. Third, the bill recognizes the need to strengthen the specificity in pleadings for patent infringement cases. It ensures that a plaintiff has in fact conducted pre-suit diligence and has a real basis for filing suit. Fourth, the legislation promotes certainty in discovery in patent cases. Discovery has become a significant weapon in the arsenal of PAEs to try to extort cost of litigation settlements in meritless cases. Fifth, the bill protects end user customers by providing explicitly that a manufacturer can intervene on behalf of and stay a case against a customer. PAEs sue customers in order to pressure the manufacturers to settle. This provision is a common sense approach that will curb this particularly egregious tactic. In conclusion, EMC believes the Innovation Act must be enacted to restore accountability and balance back into the system to alleviate the unfair burdens that PAEs are able to put on hardworking companies that are the lifeblood of our economy. We believe that this legislation is essential to protecting America's position as the most innovative nation in the world. We urge you to swiftly pass the Innovation Act and we stand prepared to help you in any way we can to bring a bill to the President's desk in short order. Thank you and I look forward to your questions.
Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Mr. Kramer, welcome. Chairman Goodlatte, Ranking Member Conyers, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. <coughs> Yahoo shares your interest in reducing patent litigation abuse and promoting American innovation. And we applaud your leadership and we support the Innovation Act. I am honored to have the opportunity to offer my perspective as Yahoo's lead IP attorney uh, and based on my previous experience as a trial attorney in private practice and with the USPTO. Yahoo is an internet pioneer and serves over 800 million users worldwide today. Our success is due in no small part to our continual innovation. We hold over 1,600 U.S. patents and enforce those patents when we felt the need to do so. Clearly, we believe in the patent system and we believe patents have a positive role to play in society. But here's the bottom line. Abusive patent litigation practices by patent trolls are harming our business and harming our industry. Right? This has a cost for Yahoo, the money, effort, uh, and time that we spend could be more productively spent elsewhere developing new products, investing in equipment, creating jobs. We believe that common sense reform, like measures proposed in the Innovation Act, would make significant strides to restore the desired balance between protecting intellectual property and discouraging patent litigation abuse. Yahoo's experience highlights how the system is now out of balance. Between 1995 and 2006, Yahoo faced between two and four patent cases on its docket at any given time. Uh, since 2007, uh, we've seen a tenfold increase in the number of cases on our docket at any given time. Right? And the merits of those cases has declined. Right? In about 96% of all cases filed against Yahoo in the last six years, plaintiffs fail to identify a patent claim at issue, and they fail to identify the features of our products at issue. Instead, we have to guess what the cases are about when they're filed. Requiring more genuine notice pleading would make cases more efficient for everybody. In most cases, we're required to produce hundreds of thousands of documents before the court construes the patent claims at issue. Most of the cost of production could be avoided by simply staging discovery after claim construction, since that is the most pivotal point in most cases. In our experience, less than 1% of all documents are actually used in the cases. Uh, placing presumptive limits on discovery would help to avoid that needless cost. In many cases, we those en entities exist only to litigate, yet when it comes time to discuss settlement, right, we are routinely told that the investors and partners who are not named plaintiffs need to approve. Joining those with a financial interest in the patent or the litigation will help curb that abuse. When we do prevent, it's next to impossible to recover our attorney's fees. For example, we were sued by a patent troll called Bright Response. Their patent was based on a provisional application uh, which conceded that the claimed invention had already been in public use more than one year prior to the filing date of the application. That is, by its own admission, the patent was invalid, yet Bright Response pursued trial, uh, charged ahead, and the jury found both the patent invalid and not infringed. However, despite the exceptional nature of that case, the district court refused to award our attorney's fees. We believe that clarifying the standard for attorney's fees in Section 285 would discourage abusive cases like that. Right? Thoughtful, balanced provisions in the Innovation Act would address all these problems. Our options for less expensive alternatives to litigation are limited or come with drastic consequences. For example, both the inter partes review and patent uh, Post-grant review apply estoppel to all issues that could have been raised before the PTO, potentially erasing our ability to defend ourselves in court. And the, and the current cover business method program is limited in scope to only those patents used in the practice, administration, or management of financial product or service. Uh, we look forward to working with this committee on these issues. I should note that while Yahoo has the wherewithal to defend itself, patent trolls know we're not going to try every case particularly where nuisance level, level settlements are available. But we're not alone. Settlement rates in our industry are at about 75%. That high settlement rate only feeds the troll model and leads to more troll litigation. We do our part. We try cases when we have to. We act as a friend of the court and others. And we act responsibly when selling our patents. Our policy has been to sell patents only to operating companies rather than to non-practicing entities. We do not want our patents to be obtained by a troll and irresponsibly asserted against others in our industry. We believe that comprehensive common sense reforms are needed. Only Congress can make those reforms. We think the Innovation Act is on the right track. It would streamline cases from the start, prioritize important decisions, reduce costs, 
force real parties and interest into the litigation and cl clarify when winning defendants are able to recover their fees. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to be heard. We look forward to working with you and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. Mr. Kapos, welcome. Jimmy Goodlatte, Ranking Member Conyers, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to provide my views on H.R. 3309. I'm testifying today solely on my own behalf. Let me start by congratulating you, Mr. Chairman, on introducing H.R. 3309, a bill designed to improve our strong patent system by removing litigation loopholes that debase strong patent rights. Various provisions of this legislation can achieve that objective given refinement. Other provisions, as I'll explain, will require but more substantial deliberation or would be best deferred. Before turning to H.R. 3309, the most important point I'll make today is that Congress simply must ensure full funding for the USPTO. Less than two years after passage of the AIA, we found ourselves again this year looking at an agency having its lifeblood drained away. I cannot overstate the destruction this is causing as the work remains without the funding to handle it, creating an innovation deficit that will require future generations of innovators to pay into the agency again and again. Nor will it be possible for USPTO to accomplish the mandates of the AIA, much less the added responsibilities contemplated by H.R. 3309 without access to its user fees. In this regard, I thank Ranking Member Conyers, uh, Ranking Member Watt, and Representatives Issa and Collins for their introduction just yesterday of the Innovation Protection Act designed to ensure full funding of the USPTO. Mr. Chairman, given the importance of U.S. innovation-based industries rooted in an innovation ecosystem that's the envy of the world, substantial alterations to this ecosystem must be undertaken with caution. Caution, in turn, calls for a deliberative process that reaches out to all stakeholders. Many innovators, today's Edisons, have not had the time to make their views heard yet. Now, Mr. Chairman, I do believe that a number of the provisions of H.R. 3309 can reduce litigation costs and increase the value of legitimate patent rights for American innovators. But I also believe significant further work is necessary to avoid major negative consequences of overcorrection, consequences more harmful potentially than the problems the legislation is intended to address. Now, turning to key provisions of H.R. 3309, fee shifting, real party and interest disclosure, litigation procedure, and joinder are good policy. As most of these provisions directly impact the work of judges, it bears emphasizing further effort is needed to ensure that judges are not deprived of their ability to exercise judgment. Consideration should be given to reducing prescription to a minimum and tasking the judiciary with turning legislative guidance into a court precedent. For covered business method, the right course, in my view, is to let Section 18 settle in further. The courts are in the best position to review USPTO interpretation of covered business method and technological. The provision is certainly not being interpreted too narrowly thus far. And tension and extension of Section 18 to software-related inventions should be avoided. Such an overextension devalues innovation implemented in software, one of America's most important and innovative sectors, discriminating against a critical field of technological innovation. The U.S. is home to a software industry that dazzles the world, and we should not declare software innovation any less important than other kinds of innovation. H.R. 3309's stay provision, offering protection to innocent end users and retailers, is also good policy. But also there, a number of improvements are needed. Finally, a covered customer will almost never be in precisely the same situation as its covered manufacturer when you're talking about um, the stay provision. That is because a covered customer can be, cannot be expected to be bound in all respects by a judgment against its covered manufacturer. There are many different circumstances affecting the two parties. As a result, 
parties will find themselves embroiled in more not less litigation caused by this provision unless clarity is added to it to avoid this result in conclusion ranking member conyers representative watt thank you for recommending me to testify today mr chairman thank you again for this opportunity to share my thoughts i commend you for introducing hr 3309 thank you mr capos mr armitage welcome thank you uh, chairman goodlatte ranking member conyers and members of the committee I do appreciate the opportunity to appear before the committee this morning. Before getting to the nitty gritty of the specific patent litigation reform topics, I would like to underscore the point that has already been made several times today on the importance of full funding to a well-functioning patent system. Uh, with this in mind, I want to offer a special thanks to Ranking Member Conyers, Members Watt and Collins for their work on this issue, particularly 3349, a bill that was introduced yesterday. While I've not had to, uh, the opportunity to study the bill in the detail, my hope is that this will be the step forward, the decisive step forward to permanent action on fixing PTO funding issues. I'd like now to move on, if I could, to discuss a few of the important provisions of Section 9 of H.R. 3309. First, Section 9 would specify that the new post-grant review system created under the American Invents Act must use the same standard for construing what a patent covers in assessing the validity of the patent that the courts use when the courts are determining patent validity in a patent infringement action. The USPTO under its current rules today is placing inventors in an untenable situation. The same patented invention that may be found invalid by an administrative patent judge in the patent office uh, would at the same time be found potentially valid by a district court judge determining that same issue of patent validity. These opposite outcomes can arise solely because the administrative patent judge is permitted under PTO regulations to use an artificial standard of claim interpretation, one that stretches the meaning of the claim beyond any subject matter that the patent owner could ever hope to assert would infringe the claim in, a pa in the patent infringement litigation. Fixing this claim construction disparity opens the door to securing broader support for another provision in Section 9, a provision that would correct the AIA's broad estoppel against later challenges to the same patent in a post-grant review procedure. The Section 9 estoppel fix corrects an inadvertent legislative drafting error in the AIA. Indeed, without this correction, the AIA's new post-grant review procedure is almost certain to be underutilized, and the important benefits that this procedure can bring to the patent system by removing questionable patents uh, would be lost, or at least significantly impaired. Another important reform in Section 9 relates to the so-called double patenting doctrine. The bill offers a codification of this judge-made law for the new first inventor to file patents that will soon begin to issue under the AIA. In a nutshell, this provision will assure that when two patents are issued with highly similar claims, they cannot be independently enforced against an accused infringer. In my written submission, I've suggested that there are other issues that relate to the AIA that merit inclusion in H.R. 3309. In the interest of time, let me briefly mention only two of them. First, the committee should consider including a statutory research use exemption to patent infringement that will replace an, replace an antiquated judge-made doctrine. The common law standard today is overly sparse and sometimes inconsistent in its application. Second, the AIA has opened the way for the committee to remove the last vestige of secrecy in the patenting process by mandating publication of all patent applications 18 months after they're initially sought. This brings me to a few final points on the provisions of H.R. 3309 that relate most directly to patent litigation. Like Mr. Gupta and Mr. Kramer, I would like the committee to move with a sense of urgency to get a comprehensive patent reform bill through the House and onto the Senate. Like Under Secretary Capos, I'd like to see the committee act with deliberation, with a 360-degree vetting of each of these provisions to assure that the details of statutory information don't destroy the promise of the underlying reform. As with many issues of life and patent reform, some of the most promising initiatives at a conceptual level may prove problematic to make work as intended. I'd like to mention perhaps just one of these. The stay of discovery provision in the bill would indeed, as convincingly I think set out in the testimony today, provide an effective and efficient vehicle for rapidly uh, eliminating non-meritorious infringement allegations. Critics of that provision 
wonder whether perhaps it has the potential to deny justice by delaying it or even increasing the aggregate cost of securing it. I'd ask the committee to be careful in provisions where one size appears to fit all patent lawsuits. Indeed, this same concern may relates to Section 6 of the bill that would mandate the judicial conference to implement very specific rules and procedures. In conclusion, I believe the case is made uh, today in the testimony that I've heard and I've read that patent reform should proceed in this Congress. The bill now before the committee has jump-started the process. I believe it's positioned the committee to make decisive progress in crafting a refined legislative package in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Thank you, Mr. Armitage. Armitage and the uh, committee, I guess your advice would be to, to proceed with all due concentrated deliberation and, and get it right. I'll give you a few weeks to get it done right, sir. There you go. The uh, chair will begin the uh, uh, questioning process under the five-minute rule, and I'll recognize myself. Uh, Mr. Gupta and Mr. Kramer, could you walk us through how you see the abusive patent litigation environment changing if this bill is enacted? Specifically, how the provisions on fee shifting, heightened 